Hey everybody, I'm Scott, and thanks for joining me again today for another edition of the accompanying podcast to the film Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. Today, I have a very special treat for you, friends. Today, I am going to play for you, mostly in its entirety, my favorite interview in its entirety amongst the 30 or so that I've done in preparing these documentaries for you. And apologies to all my friends and family and those that were involved in the film, but this was the most special of all the interviews. You're going to get a lesson in fashion history, in store history, in business partnership history, in immigration, in the history of Houston and Texas and the rise and fall of the economy in the Southwest. What I have for you is a really special treat. It's my entire interview with former CEO of Sackowitz Stores, Robert T. Sackowitz, who spent a glorious uh, mid-morning with me one day, throwing back and forth war stories about Evans and Sackowitz and him and the Meltzers, and, and it's a real treat for you. So enjoy. I'll um, kick in a few times and uh, see you on the other side. So first, um, Mr. Robert Sackwitz, tell us a little bit about the history of yourself and your store and your family and 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 how much time. How much time do you have? Well, let's do the let's do the let's do the short version. Short version. My great grandfather came to Ellis Island in uh, 1886 from uh, uh, conscription in Russia with his eldest son, leaving the rest of his family uh, about 20 miles south of Kiev. But by that time, you know, back then it was Russia. Um, the Russians didn't even like the Ukrainians then, much less uh, much less Jews. And so, well, they were going to be conscripted. They knew her, they were cannon fodder. So he left, left his wife and two other infant boys, small boys, uh, and a girl, and came into the port of entry in New York. Um, they couldn't read Cyrillic Russian. So Tchaikovich, which... Cyrillic Russian looks like an S, I guess, and an A, K, and an O, and a W, and Ch at the end, Chekovich, Chi, looks like an upside-down question mark, so they said, ah, it's I-G-Z. So they created our name as Sakowitz, um, and uh, he couldn't get work in New York. There was a group from Galveston, Texas, which was at that time in 1886, um, second only to New Orleans as a port and the most important Wall Street of uh, of the Gulf at the time. All the shipping, it was a great port, cotton, cattle, co- uh, all kinds of uh, rice, all kinds of produce. And um, got a job there peddling, needless to say, as a lot of us did. Uh, made enough money to then send for the rest of his family. And that's how my grandfather came. He was the second son. Uh, he and his uh, and his younger brother, ultimately, there were no child labor laws, so they started working immediately, about 12 years old, something like that, by the time they were 10 or 12. And uh, the mother saved some money, and uh, at the ages of uh, 21 and 19, respectively, my, my grandfather, uh, the elder one, uh, they started a little uh, gentleman's haberdashery, which back then was uh, collars and cuffs and ties and that that sort of thing in Galveston um, fast forward Houston was growing Galveston had another grand hurricane the great hurricane of 1900 is still the largest natural disaster in American history Uh, 8,000 to 10,000 people perished Um, they built a seawall and tried to come back uh, 1915, another great storm came. wasn't as bad because they had the seawall as far as lives lost, but commercially that was it. So my grandfather uh, and great uncle moved up to Houston, 
and expanded with Houston as Houston grew. The port of Houston started in the ship channel, the Houston ship channel opened in 1914. And Houston was thriving. World War I, World War II, um, it became an industrial capital. And we grew with it. Uh, we started only in men's and then men's and boys. And then, uh, too long a story, so I won't say it, but Jesse Jones, who had been head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation with FDR, uh, was head of the War Industries Board, was from Houston. And he was kind of Mr. Houston, wanted everything to grow on Main Street, told my grandfather, I'm going to build a store on Main Street to nail down. We're going to build Houston north-south, not east-west, the way some other people want to. And uh, you're going to take the first five floors. And my grandfather almost fell over. He said, how am I going to do that? He said, look, I'll pay for the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. You go lease out to other people. Lease out a woman's department. You know, that's the way it was done back then. So lease out uh, uh, a millinery and a shoe and women's apparel. And <clears throat> so they did, and they opened a store uh, on Main and Rusk in the Gulf Building, five floors, Sackwitz Brothers. Um, it was immediately successful. They did all these women's, men's, children's, but under the Sackwitz name. And continued to grow. Uh, in 1949, uh, it was growing so much, and Houston was growing so much, they wanted to really build a wonderful new store. And so uh, expanded and take over all those lease departments and run them themselves. Before we go any further, let's show you the trailer to the movie Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. Who doesn't love a rags-to-riches story? But, a rags-to-riches-to-collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story. And the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They live the American dream and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. Like they created something out of whole cloth and he help kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger non-existent parenting and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses and i just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said but it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. So was this the net, the, the lease department thing was the natural trend for stores like this? And then was there a trend back to, 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 uh, you, to you, take any ownership of them? If you, well, there wasn't a trend to necessarily take them back, but they realized that it would be more profitable if they could do that um, and wanted to expand and do it on their own. Uh, 
as far as your first question, was that the trend? If you go to Europe, even today, lesser to lesser degree, um, go to China, uh, Asia, most of the stores would lease out space. It was just a vertical mall, but they'd lease out space to manufacturers. So that even when I was an intern at Galerie Lafayette, after I graduated from college and went to work in Paris, they were still leasing space for manufacturers, giving them the equivalent of stores within a store. And that was the manner in which it actually worked as a European system. John Wanamaker and several others were the first to buy merchandise on their own account instead of leasing. So if you bought the merchant on the merchandise on your own account, you made the gross margin instead of just getting lease payments. That's... So that's what they did. Um, I don't recall in 51 um, who, I remember his name was Lowen, George Lowen, but with a... With a uh, Slavic language uh, accent. Um, I don't know whether we had leased the furs or whether the fur department or whether um, he um, he was an employee. So I can't remember in 51 whether we actually started like that. So I also don't remember exactly when um, we turned the lease over to Evans. Uh, perhaps there's something in the documentation that you can find, but I, I don't know what date it was. Um, but this is in the grand, this is in the grand time, like the fifties to the late seventies is the grand time of retailing, especially it was at Evans. So like, like your business is exploding at this time as well. Yes. In this, yes, this is 51 and Houston was growing. You have to understand in, I believe in 19, 50, if I'm not mistaken, the population was like 250,000. 1960 was 550,000. In 1970, it was a million one. I mean, it doubled every 10 years. Houston just kept being the, uh, the growth uh, leader. And um, so I do know, I mean, I do remember um, a lot of relationships because my father had his first heart attack in 1965 at the age of 58 and as he's coming out of the er he's got tubes in his mouth and tubes up his nose and he's ashen gray and i'm holding his hand and uh he said i'm gonna feed you with a fire hose because i want you to make as many mistakes as possible while i'm still alive to try and help and by the next year i mean it was like throwing me in the ocean sink or swim um I was executive vice president, general merchandise manager of the company, age 27. So I remember an awful lot of the merchandising, um, launching a lot of European goods uh, because of a little bit of my experience. And Neiman Marcus had the lock on all the women's specialty designers. And back then they were all exclusives. Um, we couldn't get those exclusives because we weren't hadn't been in the women's business had this long standing relationship so we had uh some of the los angeles designers the hollywood designers helen rose and jean louis but the french have a great expression on chef le creno look for the crack and then drive a wedge in it um european couture was always couture but they didn't have uh uh, their own ready to wear. It was called confection. And basically, the top designers over there would sell a model to Maria Karine or Mendez, who would then have the rights to reproduce that as ready to wear. And they were the manufacturers. So uh, I heard about that uh, when I had been working there. Uh, I flew over uh, in the mid 60s. Uh, right at this time when I was executive vice president, flew over and I said, let me, let me 
see if maybe we can use the European designer names and have an up on Neiman's that way, or at least be competitive, more competitive by having some great fashion names. Well, of course, one of the challenges is that the fit was different. So it's not quite like the fur industry. Um, it really depends upon the, uh, the way in which the body is formed by each manufacturer, all the specifications. European women back then, uh, compared to the American women, were uh, slightly uh, narrower shouldered, uh, not as smaller busted, bigger hipped, and shorter from the nape of the neck to the waist. This is more than you want to know, but it just basically... I'm you know, you know, the student of this, so this is great. Yes. So we saw that differential, that it just didn't fit that well. I mean, I remember hearing one of my uh, top salespeople talking to a, a lady coming in, and I'm writing a book, and this is in this book. It's, uh, the book is called More Than a Store, and it is the three decades of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, awesome. the era of those stores, where there's colossal fashion change, uh, social mores changes, uh, the civil rights, uh, Vietnam War, <clears throat> changes in the economy, OPEC, all of this happens from 1960 to 1990. And those are my store years, actually. So there are a series of vignettes, one of which includes a trip to Leningrad, about which I will tell you in a moment, with David and his wife. What was her name again? Sharon. Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. Right. So I've got a great photograph of Sharon sitting in one of the furs uh, and David sitting behind and me sort of sitting on the, because they're steps. And they're the steps to the Hermitage Museum where we were photographing uh, for our for our uh, Christmas catalog shots, some of the furs we were buying. Um, and it's a, it's a great photograph. Anyhow, uh, so I, I don't remember exactly when we started, but I do remember being involved a little bit in the fur business and meeting David and being with him. I remember a trip to Chicago that was probably, I think, uh, on record, uh, the worst snowstorm that Chicago held. It, it must have been in the 70s. Um, I, I don't remember when, either the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but there was snow up to the top of the cars that were parked on the street. It was that bad a snowstorm. It was unbelievable. Anyway, um, I, I remember, uh, you know, socializing with uh, with Sharon and David, and I remember uh, us being in business and meeting all the people uh, at the company. And we had a very nice business um, in Houston because people traveled, and um, they uh, knew that uh, a good fur coat was a great symbol of uh, success. So... I also happened to have a, we started a, a pension for starting new things and experimenting just as I had launched Courage, Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, all those people, I did their paid up all day, they're ready to wear, and launched them in the United States, not just Houston or North Texas, in the U.S. Um, and there, those are, each one has a story. That became extremely successful. Um, and with those fashion leaders, I could get other people now from New York wanting for Sackwitz to sell them because if we had these other big fashion leaders, then clearly um, they would be willing to put their merchandise with us instead of just Neiman. So we became quite competitive. <clears throat> One of the things uh, that we used as a promotional tool in the beginning, but then as an actual business was, as I'm fond of saying, long before the internet, there were catalogs. And the golden age of catalogs was in this period of roughly 1970 to 1990. 
95. And we became extremely competitive with Neiman Marcus. They would have his and hers. And I came up with this idea to have themes instead. A theme of three, four, five, ten different ways to express that theme. So the gift of knowledge, because this came from people coming up to me and saying, I want something that's really different, Robert. I want something that's unique in all the world for my, my husband or my, my wife. Okay, what do we do? So it had to be the ultimate gift. And that's what we call these, the ultimate gift. Whereas Neiman's was his and hers, ours were the ultimate gifts. And the ultimate gifts, uh, for instance, the gift of knowledge was lessons um, in skiing with Jean-Claude Kimi. Lessons in how to bust a Bronco with Larry May in World Champion Championship Rodeo. Lessons in how to dance from Mitzi Gaynor. Lessons um, in economics from Elliot Janeway. Lessons in conversation with Truman Capote. Lessons in just about anything with George Plimpton. And these were all things we got prices from their agent, and we put them in the book and sold a number of them. Well, one of the things that I fashioned upon because one of our customers uh, had just, they were always looking for something different. And I said to David, what's the most expensive fur in the world that would be totally unique? And he said, clearly, Robert, it's a Russian crown Borgesian sable and only available, you know, in Russia. I said, well, how do they grade them? How do you, how do you know? Is there a such thing as a best? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're, you know, they go through, they grade them, there's top of the line, their skins, and da da da. He said, but I'm not going to take a chance to go over there. And I mean, that's too much risk. I said, okay, what if I can pre sell it before? I said, you get it pre sold, we're going to Leningrad together. So I got one of my uh, oil friends. Who had a beautiful wife, model statuesque, and he said, I'll do it. Absolutely. John Meekham wanted to do it for his wife, Cassie. So I said, okay, we're going to want to put it in our Christmas book. So let us, you know, try and sell it. But if we don't sell it at that price, there'll be a fallback price that I'll work with you where we at least cover our cost and a little, and you guarantee to buy it. With that agreement, we set out for Linen Gate. Anyhow, we went over. That in itself is a lengthy story. As I said, it's in the book. It's one of the vignettes. But we spent three or four days in Leningrad at the auctions. And, I mean, we literally saw the bugs up uh, in the ceiling. So we knew we were being spied on because if they knew what we were buying, they'd shill someone to be able to up the bids all the time because that's what the Russians were doing. They were trying to get as much dollars as possible. So we used to go out in the snow, literally outside like Gorky Park, and talk about which numbers and the bidding. I've still got the book. As a matter of fact, uh, the the uh, the Soj uh catalog, and the problem was that it was to be a full length or what's called opera length cup. Well, the bundles were numbered and put together in such a way that that was enough for a regular dress length coat, you know, top of the knee. If it was going to be opera length, we'd have to buy two bundles. And not only buy two bundles, but one had to be lighter than the other in weight so that the sweep and the bottom would be wider and would also drape properly on the body. But it also had to be matching perfectly so that when they were let out, all the cuts they could be put together and 
end up with a uniform look. We went through and we'd go through and grade, and I learned more about the fur business in those three days than anybody ever could. I mean, you know, with other, other, with other circumstances. And uh, we'd go back, and David and I, and, I mean, we'd all talk at night. We'd sit at dinner by ourselves and go out. Long story short, we bought the top bundle of skins to him. Tonight. Plus some other lesser sables, lesser only than the top, but they were gorgeous. And the only other thing that Russia has that's totally unique compared to, as you know from Gorky Park, uh, sables, is Russian lynx. Because lush, Russian lynx, because of the weather, because of the inbreeding, whatever, um, is far more luxurious than Canadian lynx. Canadian lynx is good, but Russian lynx is better. So we bought the top bundle we could find of Russian lynx as well. But So when did you start to see a shift in things? You know, in the fur industry, it was, in my opinion, a combination of um, <clears throat> the mass production and cheapening the product to make it available to everybody, combined with the anti-fur movement, which then affected the demand. But in the in the in the non fur business, in the retail and ready to wear business, when did you start to signal the shift? And then was it uh, parallel to what you saw happening in the fur business? Well, in the fur business, PETA, PETA had a lot to do with it. You know, the people against the fur uh, use of furs and pelts, animals, all that. Um, ours was also the fur business began to, to drop off in our part of the world when the economy shifted. We boomed in the 70s with OPEC and everything. All of the oil-producing states, Texas being the biggest among them, um, Oklahoma, New Mexico, to some degree California, uh, were really favorably impacted. And People had a lot of money, they bought furs, they bought couture, they bought... When OPEC basically crashed, oil dropped from forty nine seventy five a barrel, it's high, to August of 1985, $8 a barrel. And the economy was destroyed because it wouldn't come back. And <clears throat> more banks and commercial real estate and businesses went under than any other place or at any other time, even more than the Depression as far as Texas was concerned. Uh, the Depression of 1929, 30, 30, no, 32. Um, so we had to follow for a restructuring in Chapter 11. Um, we were able to come out of it with a, a partner from uh, Australia who bought Bonwe Teller and B. Altman. Um, but then the flash crash came along in 1987, 88, 89. And New York and Wall Street were really hurt by that. So that there was a recession in ninety two in the in the in the ni early nineties as well, and when people don't have that kind of disposable income, and they're worried about paying the rent, they sure as hell ain't thinking about buying a fur. So, the combination of changes in the economy, changes in social mores, changes basically in our culture really put a damper on the entire fur industry. And, uh, you know, when the 11 came along, David was was very trying to assist us, um, wanted to stay in business. They created a separate little area of their own in a, a, right near us. Uh, we were fighting for our lives. And, of course, Jerry Gronauer was running that. For Evans. Yep, I remember him well. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
that that was the demise of the Evans relationship with 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 Sackwoods. So we re should we came back in, but then it it didn't uh, Evans didn't want to take the chance of the of that risk. Jerry then left them to run our fur departments. And so he left being the manager of Evans Furs to stay with Sackwoods as manager of the Sackwoods Furs on our uh, reorg period. Well, so even at that point, you didn't abandon it. I'm sorry? And even at that point, you didn't abandon Furs. No. Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier is a three-part series. So here's the trailer for part two, which even though you haven't seen part one yet, you'll see what's coming down the pipe. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident, and this setback rocked the family during a time when Brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, the relationship skills were really lacking, and that got passed down. DNA really plays a role in in any you know in anyone's well-being. All I know is that he had a photographic memory. He was brilliant, and the family loved him. So she was always you know, like I was her little doll. She loved, but she was very interesting and fun and vivacious. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that gonna happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got got hurt because their coats weren't there. And you know, it was it was just a bad thing. Not for nothing, we were supposed to be life. You know what I mean? We were following, you know, that suit. I'll never forget it. He threw this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table and he says, this is what Evans is. And you know what happened to these dinosaurs? That wasn't what the legacy that he wanted for himself. He didn't want to wake up and smell the coffee. So he just, you know, he did the things that he enjoyed doing. Interesting. So tell me with the last few minutes that we have, um, what do you think about what do you think about when you reminisce and you reflect about those times, the, the good part of the times, forgetting the demise stuff? Um, because you know, uh, I saw it in in David and my family, and my grandfather and, and great uncle, you know, before David, just like you with your parents, and so that was like a really special time in in retail and um, and, oh, it was, and merchandising. It was. I mean, I took, I became. Uh, president of the company, and and in sixty nine seventy, we were doing about thirty two million. I took it to one hundred and sixty five million, which today would be a, a billion six. I mean, you know, it's t- ten times. That's the value of the dollar. Um, and we expanded all over. We were in Arizona. We were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were in uh, Houston, Midland, Amarillo, Dallas, uh, and a catalog store it was a separate store so it was a really boom period if you just kept going we were privately held neiman's was held by a public company and they were all over the country so they could survive with their out of texas out of state stores chicago all the rest of them did very well during that period when we were collapsing you know one man's meets another man's poison and uh, it's a whole other story. But it was a, a, a very unique era of launching new product, of uh, what turned out to be the 
uh, youth quake, a youth boom, uh, all kinds of innovation, new music, new everything. And just post-Vietnam, tailed off, uh, and then ultimately uh, along came other aspects of this. the country became over-mauled, um, internet came along. I mean, today, Neiman's, Nordstrom's, and Sachs, all three, if I'm not wrong, um, each have at least 30% of their business uh, on, on the online. But the problem is they're returning stuff all the time because it doesn't fit necessarily. The three things that they still don't have right, that we could never get right in the cattle, fit, fabric, and color. And so those three things, uh, you have to see the garment. Yeah, that, and I would add the fourth being being able to interact with the item. Correct, right? Yeah. Yep. So um, that was the era, uh, I would say, uh, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores, and uh, everybody was uh, put it this way. When it was just like the little girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead. When it was good, she was very, very good. When she was bad, she was hard. <laughs> that is a great way to wrap up for our time today. I want to thank you so much. Come on. I told you that was going to be special, didn't I? Some great, great stories there. Some great history. I told you. So I want to thank Robert Sackowitz for his time and for participating in the making of the documentary, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. I'm Scott Hunter. I'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining us.